topic this week is from the book of Haggai. We're starting a new book, Holy Purses. Starting, well, we're going to do a little overlap with Ezra, Ezra chapter 5, verse 1, the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edu, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the Lord God of Israel, who was over them. So Zerubbabel and Yeshua, the son of Yozadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. And so we have a time period here where they were working together and cooperating together. We have uh, the, the governor and we have the uh, spiritual leader, the Kohen Gadol, as well as two prophets together and the people working together in God's cause. That's a wonderful time period uh, to, to uh, remember and to look back on and learn from and for them to experience. Ezra came along about 70 years later, so he probably wasn't even born during Haggai's time, but he is writing about it in preparation because of their influence helped when he comes along 70 years later to help him in his work. And so Ezra mentions Haggai and Zechariah here at this point. When we're done with Haggai, then we'll do the book of Zechariah. So in Haggai, well, I guess before we get to Haggai, so looking at the timeline of where this took place, so we have on top, we have the Persian kings, Cyrus who lets us return, his son Cambius, and then Smyrnas, and the temple being built starting with during the Cyrus years, and, uh, and then paused for a little while, and then we come to Darius, and then under that we have the temple being built, Zerubbabel, and then Haggai, and we have the exact time of when Haggai prophesied. We don't have that for all the prophets, but we know the exact time when he was because we're able to correlate it with Darius, and so Haggai prophesied in the year 520 BCE. And we see that mentioned here in Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, and to Yeshua, the son of Jehozadak, the Kohen Gadol, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. So we have the date right there in the second year, sixth month, first day of the month of Darius. And so again, we know the exact time period when he prophesied. And we don't have a lot of writings. We only have two chapters uh, written by Haggai. And so not a whole lot. Um, and we don't know how long he continued to minister and prophesy. He might have just written down two, but he might have continued to work in ministering to the people and helping guide Zerubbabel and, and Yeshua in their work. Uh, and in helping the people in the building and bringing it together. But we only have two chapters, and they all take place within less than a few months' period of time of him writing it. And so some people are given a, a gift, a gift of prophecy or whatever gift, and it's not that they have that for life, per se. He was given it, given it for a time. He wrote two chapters, all again within a few months' period of time, and then that's it. He didn't write anything more after that. And so... Uh, it, God is in control. God is the Lord. God is the king. God is sovereign. God decides what gifts, what talents, what abilities to give to who at what time. And so it's not, there's no life, uh, life uh, permanent job position uh, or gift that God gives. He gives and, and then he uses as he sees fit and as the need is there. All right, so if anyone comes along and tells you they have the gift of whatever, uh, you know, you got to be real careful with that. Uh, God gives, again, for a time, and it might not be there the next day. Uh, God chooses to use his gifts. Talents is another thing. But spiritual gifts are miraculous gifts that God gives for his purpose, for ministering his word to people for the growth of his kingdom. So that's a little bit on, on Haggai. And he mentions here Zerubbabel, the governor, and, uh, and then Yeshua, and uh, the son of of Jehozadak, Jehozadak, and we'll see a whole chapter on him, or pretty much a whole chapter where he is the focus of it. But an interesting thing here, it's worded a little bit different than it was in Ezra, his father's name. And so you have Yeshua, which means salvation, and he is the, is the son of Jehozadak. And Sadak, right, Sadak, uh, is righteous, and Yeho is beginning a yud heh vav -Hey, 
uh, without that final hey there is its conjunction. So God or the Lord is righteous. Right? So here we have Yeshua is the son of the righteous God. That's a pretty good name, huh? I mean, if you can get, pick your own name, that might be a name you might want to have, right? And so that's who he is. And of course, he's foreshadowing Yeshua, the son of the righteous God. And so he's playing the role here as a Kohen, or he is a Kohen here. And uh, we see the Yeshua that comes later on was from the line of David, but also plays the role of a Kohen currently. He is our, the Messiah Yeshua, is our Kohen Gadol, but when he was on earth, he was of the tribe of Judah, and also a prophet. Now with his name, Yeshua, the son of Ben uh, Yehozatak, uh, we have the beginning here referring to the Lord of Yeho, right? So like Yehovah. And again, that's the yud he vav he. Now, in other places, it seems to be more like a yah, right? Like the name of uh, Isaiah, right? So yah at the end, um, and other names like that. Uh, Zechariah, uh, uh, well, I don't know, that may not be, <laughs> but other names that end with the, uh, the yah, and in Psalm it uses yah sometimes. And so there's, we don't know exactly how to pronounce yud he vav he. Some people will tell you they know how it should be pronounced, and that it should be Yahweh, uh, or Yehovah, or many so other variations. But we don't have the vowels, and the name hasn't been pronounced in hundreds, if not thousands of years. As we look through the Gospels, uh, as well as the writings of Paul, and of Luke, and of Peter, and of John, and of James, none of them the second part of the Bible, none of them mention his name. None of the prayers that we have recorded of Yeshua or any other words or statements that he made, does he use the yud He vav He name? So they might not even have been pronouncing it then. So we don't have a record of how, whether in the Greek or however, that it should be translated, that it should be pronounced. So anyone who comes along and says, this is the way to pronounce Yud and hey and Vav and hey together, they don't know. Here, so here we have an example of it, more like a Yehovah as opposed to a Yahweh. Uh, but again, without the vowels, we don't know for sure exactly which way or some other way that it should rightly exactly be pronounced. So be careful of anyone who gets real dogmatic about that and tries to pronounce and proclaim that is the way and the only way, and there's even denominations that basically have started on that whole premise um, and, and focus. So here's a good example of that, how it's used in different ways. All right. So anyway, back to the text. Then in verse 2, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, and the people were saying, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Now, how could they be saying that? Why would they be saying that? We just saw in that chart and in Ezra that they were building and God had blessed and Cyrus gave them permission to build. And Cyrus allowed us to leave Babylon and come back to Jerusalem for the distinct purpose of building Jerusalem and building the temple. He even offered to help finance it and to give protection as they worked. He gave a written decree. God had prophesied it through Daniel and, and uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah. And Isaiah, even hundreds of years in advance, prophesied Cyrus by name and that that's what he would do, that he would allow us to go back and build. So how could they possibly say the time has not yet come, the time that the Lord's house should be built? Initially, they had started building. Initially, they were building. But then some opposition came. Some of the people who had moved into the area after Babylon had taken us out and Babylon moved people in, they got comfortable there in the land. They started liking it, kind of took possession of it, felt ownership of it, and they didn't like these people coming back and building a, a city there, a capital there, a temple there. And so they started complaining to the Persian kings. 
And so a little bit of opposition, or maybe even a lot of opposition, and so people use that as a good enough excuse that, you know what, maybe we shouldn't be building. Maybe this is not the right time. Yeah, God prophesied, yeah, there's blessings, yeah, but maybe that, maybe a year from now, maybe two years, maybe a little bit longer, maybe some next, maybe the next generation. Sometime will come, but maybe not right now. We don't like opposition. But you know, when we're serving the Lord and moving forward in the Lord's will, we should expect opposition. If we wait for all the lights to be green, for everything going in our direction, it's never going to happen. We're not in heaven yet. This is still the earth, fallen earth. It's not the new heavens and the new earth. Satan is still the prince of this earth. He's stolen it away from humanity. And he still controls a, a lot of what takes place here. And he will continually oppose God's work. He'll continue to throw roadblocks and difficulties and continue to use carnal hearts to try and stop God's work from moving forward. So we should not be surprised by it. Actually, we should expect it. Because if we're moving in the same direction, if we're not coming face to face with the devil sometimes, then we're moving in his same direction. And we need to be going in the opposite direction that he's going. And so we'll butt heads. And that again should be expected not used as an excuse for not moving forward. Oh, my boss said, well, I have to, uh, or my spouse said, or all these difficulties or calamities will come and I won't be able to provide for my family and or whatever other kind of excuses, whatever the kind of other fears Satan will bring up, fear of loss or fear of difficulty, Fear of ridicule, being mocked or teased, or being different than the rest. Peer pressure. Don't use those as excuses for doing God's will. And that's exactly what they were doing here. But there could have been another motive, or there definitely was another motive as well. And we'll see that here as we continue to read on. Verse 3, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. So another nice, convenient reason for saying this is not the time to be busy building the Lord's house because i got to build my own. i got other stuff to do. I have to put a nice roof on mine. I have to paddle my house. I have to decorate it. I have to fancy it. I have to make it even nicer. Now, certainly they needed shelter, right? That's one of the things they tell us we need for life, shelter. So, but they had shelter. He's not talking about shelter here. He's talking about paneled houses, elaborate houses that they use as an excuse. I need to go bury my father. I, need, I just bought this piece of land and I need to take care of it and I need to tend to it. I need to go see him. And Yeshua said, let them take care of themselves. You follow me. Don't use excuses. I mean, we need to, we need to bury our, 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 our parents. Or, but the, they were using that as an excuse for not doing God's will. So they were putting themselves first, putting their needs first, putting their houses first. And Haggai is, through the Lord, the Lord using Haggai to ask them, consider your ways. Search your heart. Check out your motives. Why don't you want to build the Lord's house at this time? What is first in your life? Who has priority? Who is king? Who is Lord? Do you have any idols there that you're putting in place in front of God? And he's saying your house here. Your house is what in this text is. And you're going and building your own houses. Building up your own houses. And so may we consider our ways and who is first and foremost in our heart, in our lives. Does the Lord have top priority? Is he first? 
And some of the ways we can consider our ways is to look at our checkbook. We go over the last year and look at who had the majority of the checks. Where did the majority of the money go? Because where our treasure is, there our heart is. Or our credit card accounts. Where did the funds go? To whom did they go? And that is one indication of where our loyalties are first and foremost. Another thing along that line is time. Where are we spending our time? What activities are we involved in? Are we serving the Lord? And more than a couple hours a week. Are we serving him throughout the week? Are we looking for opportunities, whether it's school or at work or shopping or wherever we are in our neighborhoods? Are we praying and looking for opportunities to share God with other people? Are we involved in some sort of ministry that helps minister God's word? especially the people who don't yet know him. There's lots of activities that we can get involved in. We don't all have to do the same thing. Not everyone preaches, not everyone sings, but there's lots of other things even within a synagogue setting. Working the sound, serving the food, helping set up, helping clean up, helping to work around the building, but also other ministries, food ministries and Nursing home ministries, there's lots of things to get involved in, lots of ways that can help. Visit people that are sick, minister to people in the hospitals, check on people who are missing, help give people rides. There's so many different ways. Pass out cards, pass out tracts, just open up conversations, pray for God to lead in a conversation, wherever again we are, let it shine. Wear a t-shirt, have a bumper sticker. There's so many different ways to get God's message out there in various forms. Are we using our time and our talents? Are we using our abilities for our own hobbies, for our own activities, our own talents? Lots of talents, lots of gifts, lots of abilities that can be used in the Lord's service. Lots of ways to minister. Lots of ways to share and bless people. In various forms, whatever gift, whatever we'd like to do. God gives us the ability to like things and the ability to do things, like doing things, so that we can use them for his honor and glory. And at the same time we're blessing others, we will be blessed as well. There's nothing more fulfilling than using the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the desires that we have in blessing other people and leading them to heaven as a result, maybe not a direct leading, maybe not again a gospel call, but every piece helps, every piece adds together in demonstrating God's love. Who has our thoughts? Who do we think about? Who do our prayers revolve around? Are they always about self? Are they always about our own needs? Or are we praying for other people? What are we thinking about when we're not thinking about anything? And when you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you think, what exit am I at? <laughs> you know, <laughs> where did the last 20 minutes go? Where did the last 10 minutes go? What street am I? Where am I? You know, you just drive. What were your thoughts on? What were we thinking about? When you're just daydreaming, who has our mind? Who has our thoughts? What grabs our attention? Is it the Lord and the Lord's work? Is it the lost, people who need him, people who are needing God's blessings and God's help? Who do we think about? Is it our own desires, our own wants? Who is superior in our lives? And how about our conversations? Out of the abundance of the heart, so the mouth speaks. Who do we like to talk about? Who do we talk about when we're talking about it with other people? Is it our dog and our cat? Our grandchildren, our kids? Us? What do we talk about? 
What do we post on social media? Consider our ways. What is our purpose here? What is our purpose on this planet? It's not to draw attention to self. It's not to build ourselves up. It's not to build up our own houses. I'm not just talking about physical houses, but our reputation, our name, our self, our career, our social contacts. To have 500, 5,000 friends. We don't even know who half of them are or more than half of them are. Our purpose is to serve the Lord. And in doing so, he gives us friends. In doing so, he gives us places to live. In doing so, he gives us joy in using our talents and our abilities and having conversations and ministering to other people. As we put him first, he put us first. He put us first. He created us, planned us. He had you in mind before he even created Adam and Eve. You've been on his thoughts. You've been in his prayers. Yeshua is interceding for you and me right now, continually before the throne of the Father. He thinks about us. He communicates with the Father and through the angels about us. He's building houses for us. He's building mansions for us in the New Jerusalem. Even before we're there. He's preparing for us. And he gave himself for us. At a great price, at a great sacrifice. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. Yeshua so loved us, he gave his life. He walked around without a home, without a place to lay his head. Came to be rejected and hated and have almost no friends for you and me so that he could have friends for eternity. He went through horrible physical pain, but even more importantly, emotional pain and mental pain and spiritual separation from the Father for you and me. And in sacrificing, he sacrificed all. If he would have lost that battle, if he would have lost the risk of him coming to this horrible planet, taking on flesh and battling against the devil. If he would have lost, he would have lost his throne. He would have lost his seat. He put us first. It would seem only natural we should put him first in our lives. In appreciation for that. In commitment to that. In dedication for that. And that he first created us. And that he first loved us. And love should awaken a love response to put him first in our lives. And to commit and dedicate everything to him. Haggai chapter 1 verse 6. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. You ever feel like this is not enough? You ever feel like the week is longer than the paycheck? You put it in, and then it's not there. You thought you made a deposit, and you look at the bank account, and it's less there than you thought. You look in your wallet, you look in the purse, and there's less there than you had remembered. Where'd it go? Where'd it leak out? Is there a hole in my purse? Is there a hole in my pocket? I'm working hard, I'm trying hard, I'm just not getting ahead. Can't get ahead no matter what I try. I try this venture, I try that venture, I work extra hours, I'm just never getting ahead, never getting ahead of the bills. 
never getting caught up, never feeling satisfied, never feeling like there's enough, never like we have enough. Ever feel that way? Well, maybe there's a reason. Consider our way. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Consider your ways. Maybe it's our priorities that are messed up. Maybe that's why it seems to disappear. Maybe that's why we don't have enough. Maybe that's why we're not satisfied. And that's why it's disappearing. We can only expect that God would bless the amount that we have if we first put him first. That's the whole principle of the tithe. It's a demonstration of putting God first. Before anything else, putting him first. So who's first in our lives? Who gets the first amount? Does God get that first 10% off the top, even before anything else is considered? Now, if we do it off of the net, if we do it off only what comes in on the paycheck, then that means the government is first. Because they already took out their amount. <laughs> but if we do it on, what, on the, the gross that we earn, then we're putting God first, 10% of that, and offering on top of that. The tithe just shows that we're honest before God. That's what he says is his. So it's returning what is his. Offering on top of that demonstrates appreciation. Right? If, if, if I borrow my neighbor's lawnmower, it's his, but it's in my possession as I cut the, my grass, right? If I return it to him, did I do him a great favor? Or was I just honest? <laughs> and I just gave him back what was his, right? If I don't give it back, what am I? A thief, right? I'm a thief, right? If I don't give it back, I'm stealing, I'm holding it back, I'm a thief. But if I just give it back, in hopefully as good a shape as he gave it to me, then I'm just being honest. It's his. Right? So God says it's his, that first 10% is his. Now, in appreciation for borrowing his lawnmower while mine was broken down, if I give him a fruit basket or a gift card or something nice, I'm now showing my appreciation. Right? I gave him back what was his, and then I gave him something on top of that as well. And that's what the Bible outlines as the tithe. The tithe is his. It goes for the ministering to the ministers, and then the offerings on top of that for all of us to do the work of the Lord moving forward. That's a basis on how he lays it out for us. And as we put him first, and it's not that God needs the money. God doesn't need it. He owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything in the world is the Lord's. Everything in the universe is the Lord's. All the silver and all the gold, it's all his. He doesn't need our stuff. He needs our heart. He wants our heart. And as a demonstration of that, He tests us. Right? There was nothing really physically wrong with the tree of knowledge of good and evil in, in, in the Garden of Eden. I don't think there was poison inside the, the fruit. The only problem with it is God said don't eat of it. It was a test of obedience. It was a test of loyalty. It was a test of love. And that's really all the tithe and offering principle is. It's, help, it's to help us to consider our ways. It's to help us in that one area of our life to see really who we're putting first. And it ends up being an important area of our life. Again, where our treasure is, there our heart will be. And so it's to help us to track. It's to help us to see. It's to help us to measure, to consider our ways, to see who really has first priority in our lives. It's so simple to just, so easy to just say, oh yeah, he's first in my life. So you say, oh, I love my spouse. 
But ask the spouse, <laughs> do you feel loved? How is it demonstrated? How is it manifested? It's that area God gave us that as a demonstration. So that we can see for ourselves. I mean, it's not for anyone else to see. But for us to see, God doesn't need to see. God doesn't need to know. God can read our heart. But it's to help us to see. It's to help remove selfishness from us. Because that's what we're born with. That's what encompasses our lives. Put our houses first. And so he gave us this tithing and offering principle so we can learn to unselfishly put God first. Do we put the government first and all our other needs first, our bills, our landlord first, or the mortgage company, food, and all these other things first? And then we give God what's on the bottom. There'll never be anything there. There'll never be enough. Doesn't matter how much you make, doesn't matter how rich you are. You make hundreds of thousands of years, and I've heard lots of people making hundreds of thousands a year and still hugely in debt. There's never enough. There'll never be enough. The needs always grow. If we wait till we have enough, we say, well, when I get ahead, when I finally get that job, when I finally get that raise, when I finally have more than enough to pay my bills, then I'll start putting God first. Then I'll start returning tithes and offerings. We'll never get there. We'll always be like that last text said. Earning wages that aren't there. Putting money into a purse that disappears. That's what happens. That's how it works. Because we won't have God's blessings upon it. He says, test me, try me in this. It's a faith venture. It strengthens our faith. So it gives us the ability to see God at work. To see the power of God take place in our lives. I forget if it was Elijah or Elijah. I met that widow. On her last meal. For her and her kid. Was the prophet being selfish? Saying, well, give me first. And then feed your kid? <laughs> Let your kid starve to death. Give me the meal. We only got enough for two little cakes. Give me first. That sounds so outrageous. How dare you take food out of the kid's mouth? But she did it. She passed the test. And God blessed her abundantly. What would have happened if she would have said, no, no, no I got to feed my kid. And I'm hungry too. It's been a while since hey, this is all we have left. What would have happened? They would have had their last meal. Consider our ways. Go up on the mountain. Enter into the mountain with God. Come up higher. And put him first. Build up the temple of the Lord. And he's talking there about the physical temple, but more than the physical temple, he's talking about then and now. Build up the kingdom of God. Fortunately, it takes finances to build up the kingdom of God. I talked to the electric company, but they said, sorry, we don't care. <laughs> Religious institution or not. <laughs> Called the water company, said, sorry. <laughs> to print the literature to have the internet. Things take funds for the gospel to go to the world. And that's what God has called us to do. Take the gospel to the world. And look at some companies. I mean, there's companies. There's companies that are ruling the world right now that weren't in existence 20 years ago. Didn't know their names probably weren't even anything 20 years ago, maybe 30 years max. Didn't exist. And today, they're in basically every country of the world. Leaders of, continent, leaders of countries are begging for them to do their bidding, to help them out, to sell them information that they've gleaned and stolen and taken from people. And they're ruling the world. They're influencing minds in little, no time at all. World dominance 
Their names are known, the leaders' names are known, the companies' names are known all around the world in basically every known language, every common language, every major language. It's just 20 or 30 years. And how long have we had the word of God? How long have we had the gospel? How long have we had God's truth? How long have we been working to bring it to the world? Well, how can they build so fast? How can they spread so fast? And God's word is so slow. Consider our ways. Are we financing those companies? Even if it's free, but we're giving them our information to sell? To advertisers and others, whoever, I don't know what they all use it for. I don't think anyone knows what everyone is using all that information for. They're making a lot of money from that information, that's for sure. It's important to somebody. And we're promoting it, we're helping it. As opposed to promoting the word of God. When the disciples had it, 11 disciples and those that joined them took the gospel to the then known world. In 20 years. God can take our message, take God's message, take God's word throughout the world overnight if we get serious. I believe if every professed believer gave a faithful tithe and offering and the funds were used faithfully for spreading God's word, the gospel would have gone to the world and we'd be home already long before now. And if we do it right now, it started today and everyone did it faithfully, I believe the gospel would go to the world within a few years. Consider our ways. Who is first in our lives? Who has our time? Who has our resources? Who has our thoughts? Who has our conversations? Verse 9. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. God says, not only does it leak out an empty purse or a hole in a purse, but I blow it away. God's saying, I'm taking responsibility. I'm the one who did that to you. I withheld the rain. I withheld the blessings. I blew the money away. I took it out of your purse. I took it out of your pocket. Why would he do that? Because he loves us, that's right, because he loves us. Yeah. He's trying to get our attention. He knows what's best for us, and he wants us to experience life more abundantly, for our faith to grow, for our trust to grow, for him to be able to fill us with his spirit, but when we're filled with ourselves, there's no room for him. And so he allows it to disappear, to wake us up. Whatever it takes to wake us up, whatever it takes to get our attention. He's trying to get our attention. He loves us. And so he's coming towards us. Right? Look at a child, right? They try and get your attention. Right? They do it in very different ways. <laughs> it might be annoying. They might do something to get, when pull her hair. They may do something to get her attention. God's trying to get our attention. To wake us up with blessings or with calamities. Whatever it takes to wake us up. And if there's some need, some empty hole in your life, maybe it's finances, but maybe some other area. Maybe it's socially, maybe it's fulfillment, maybe it's love. Consider our ways. Who is first? We want more friends, put God first. Make God your friend first. Be content with him. And then he can add all the other stuff. That's the principle. Applies to every aspect of our lives. Verse 10, Therefore the heavens above withheld the dew, and the earth withholds the fruit. For I called for a drought on the land, and on the mountains, and on the grain, and on the new wine, and on the oil, and wherever the ground brings forth, on man and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. He blew it away. He withheld it. And so calamity came. 
They came back from Babylon. They began to work. They began to prosper. Things were going great. A little bit of calamity came. They, oh no, it's not. Let's hold off. Let's start building our own homes. They get busy with doing that. And then it just snowballed negatively. Now they planted crops and they're not growing. And they're not getting the rain they need. And little they have is blown away from them. Why isn't the gospel going to the world? Consider our ways. Why aren't we individually and corporately as a congregation and as believers worldwide, why aren't we seeing the blessings and the power of God? Consider our ways. Who is first and foremost in our lives? And may it start with us. Let's not wait for some other person, some other congregation, some other leader, some other thing. Let it start with us, any one individual, any one of us. To commit our lives and dedicate our lives fully and unreservedly to the Lord. And the Lord can wake us up and fill us with a gift and a spirit. And use us. As he used Haggai to stir Zerubbabel up again. To stir Yeshua, your son of Zadok, up again. God can awaken us and Use any of us to lead the way. Haggai probably wasn't heard of before this. And again, after two chapters, within a few months, he doesn't write another thing. God might have a place and a calling for each. I, do, I, know, I know he has a place and a calling for each one of us. And some will have an impact that will last thousands of years. Thousands of years later, we're still reading and talking about Haggai. And he wrote two chapters within a few months' period of time. Then Zerubbabel and Yeshua, the son of Uzadak, the Kohen Gadol, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Praise the Lord. A few verses, 11 verses, had the impact to move the heart of the governor and the spiritual leader and all the people, and they came together. And they feared the presence of the Lord. They feared disappointing him. They feared breaking his heart. They feared hurting him, hurting his name, hurting his reputation among the nations and the people around. They feared not fulfilling his will. They were afraid of not setting the stage for the Messiah to be able to come. And they obediently put God first. And they changed their ways. How does that happen? How do we change our ways? So we consider our ways, and then how do we change our ways? If God's been bringing to your mind some area that he's not first. Maybe our conversation, maybe our thoughts, maybe our money, maybe our talents, maybe our time. And what do we do with that? Do we just walk away feeling guilty? Do we just walk away disappointed in ourselves and kicking ourselves? We consider our ways so that our ways can be changed. We consider our ways, and when God brings conviction, when God shows to us, whether it's been these calamities or been these blessings or been this wake-up call that he's brought to your mind, then we confess it. And we say, Lord, I'm sorry I've been selfish. I've been putting this idol first. I've been putting this property first. I've been putting this house first. I've been putting this job first. I've been doing this, this, this spouse search, this, this whatever it is. Putting myself first. Trying to fit in, trying to glorify putting my kids first, putting my parents first. Whatever it is, whatever God brought to your mind, confess it to him specifically and lay it at his feet. And Lord, if you want to take it away, I surrender it to you. Better to enter into heaven with one eye or one arm than to miss out on heaven and remain in a whole body here on this earth. And if God chooses to take it away, then so be it. Abraham had to willingly put Isaac up on the altar. 
Put it on the altar, and if God wants to take it, let him take it. And if he wants to return it to you, let him return it to you. But surrender it to the Lord. Give it all to him. We don't own anything. Nothing is ours. It's all his. He can't take it with us. There's not a hearse big enough to hold it. You're going to build a pyramid for all your stuff, and then you're going to steal it away anyway. Give it to the Lord for safekeeping. Surrender all to him. So we confess it, and we turn it over to him. Mentally, verbally, Lord, I give this to you. It could be a good thing. I'm sure Isaac was a good thing. It could be a good thing. Not necessarily a bad thing. Certainly the bad things you need to give, her, give over to the Lord and confess it and ask him to take it away from you. But it could be a good thing. But Lord, if it's become my idol, if it's become my focus, I surrender it to you. I give it to you. And then we ask, we accept his forgiveness and we listen for whether he tells us to walk away from it or not. We can give him permission to take it away and we can ask him to give us the wisdom and the knowledge to know whether or not we should physically turn and walk away from it. Sell it, throw it away, whatever it takes. Give it to someone else. It's not a bad thing. And then ask for God's Holy Spirit to give us the ability to do that. It's that simple, simple steps. Consider, pray, Lord, show me. As he does, confess, surrender, and ask for the Holy Spirit to give us repentance to turn and walk in a new way, to put him first in every area of our lives. And then we can be filled with his spirit, filled with his joy, filled with his peace, filled with his contentment, filled with his happiness, his joy, his talents, and go and bless others. And no one who has surrendered father or mother, husband or wife, child or friend, who will not have tenfold more, I think that's the number the Bible gives, tenfold more, maybe even bigger, tenfold more in this life and in the life to come. God will bless us abundantly as we put him first in every aspect of our lives. Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. Doesn't get any better than that. The Lord is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. Nothing can go wrong. We have nothing to fear. Oh, there'll be problems, but the Lord is with us. He'll take us through. Whether we're martyrs or whatever, he's with us. And if he allows it, it's okay. It's all good. The Lord is with us. The Lord is with us when we're disobedient. The Lord was with them when they were building their own homes. But he was there with them, blowing it away. <laughs> But how much more to be walking hand in hand, arm in arm with him, in footstep with him. The Lord with us, moving together with him, in harmony with him, in unity with him. There's no better friend. There's no more important acceptance. There's no greater joy. And being with the Lord, having the Lord with us, sensing and knowing his presence. It's worth more than all the world. Heaven wouldn't be heaven without him. Having the Lord with us makes all the difference in this life and the life to come. It's a wonderful promise. They surrendered, they came together, they served the Lord, and the Lord was with them. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Yeshua, the son of Jehoshadak, 
and the Kohen Gadol, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of the king Darius. So within three weeks' time, which I think is a pretty fast time, especially at that time. You know, it's not like they just put a post out on the internet and just you know, spread it out real quick. But going around and sharing the message of the Lord and allowing time to sink in and for it to spread and to bless and for the people to turn and repent. And in three weeks' time, they come together and they're back building the house of the Lord in unison, together, in harmony, together, multitude, together, coming together and serving the Lord. That's a powerful chapter. This is a powerful verse in the Bible. It's not always that this happened. It's not always that it happens in our lives. It's not always that it happens in our congregation. It's not always that it happens in our families. But to happen here, them all to come together. Praise the Lord. What a great example. And what was it that brought about this great unity? What was it that brought about this building up of the Lord's house? The considering their ways. Their turning and their changing. Their repentance. And the Lord's presence with them. And that's what will happen in our day, in our life. And that's what has to happen before the Lord can come. It will happen with us or without us. There will be a people who will surrender all to the Lord, that the Lord will be with, and the Lord will build up his temple, will build up his people, and it will be a light to the world. And we'll take the gospel to the world. I pray that each one of us are a part of that. I pray that I'm a part of that. I pray that God can use me. I pray there's nothing in my heart or life that be a distraction or get in the way or, or be a stumbling block who would stand between me and him. And if you're in harmony with that thought and that prayer, in the moment when we pray, give God permission to, cons- to search your way, to give you the ability to consider your way. In the moment when we pray, if you want to give God, give God permission Open your mind so that you can consider your ways. Over the past week, over the past month, over the past year, who's first in your life? Be willing to let God reveal that to you. In a moment when we pray, you can say that to God. Secondly, if God's already revealing some area in your life that's a God, that's an idol, that's there bigger than God, that you've put God first before God, In a moment when we pray, surrender that to him. Confess it. It's between you and him. Silently, just surrender it to God. God, I give this to you. I give it. Take it away if you want. It's yours. I don't want it. Surrender it to him. Accept his forgiveness. And accept his Holy Spirit to give you the ability to walk in new lives of life. Third, if you're sensing God's call and God's power to work in your life, to minister even more fully for him, the moment when we pray, surrender, and let the Lord do his work. Fill you with his gifts, with his talent, using you and being a blessing this week to someone in some tangible way. Let us pray together. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe, thank you for anointing Haggai with this message. Thank you for giving him the boldness to share it with the people. Thank you for the willingness of the people, the leaders and the people to accept it and to change their ways and come in harmony with you. Lord, do that same miracle in our lives now. Speak to us. Reveal to us anything that's between us and you, anything that we're putting first before you. Bring conviction. Give us faith. Give us trust to move out and put you first in every area of our lives, whether finances or time or talents or abilities, thoughts, 
or desires or prayers. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit and use us in putting you first and others second and spreading your gospel to the world in Yeshua's holy name. Amen.